Driver Arts Driver is a 1.6 million pound um, research project from the University of Brighton, um, funded by the European Regional Development Fund and the Arts Council England. And it focuses on um, sparking a superfusion of creativity, technology, business and innovation when using data as a tool. Uh, participants in the programme can have access to Gatwick Airport's real-time data, as well as a range of support, uh, expertise, events, funding and training from the University of Brighton up until the end of this year. Um, so everything you need to know can be found at driverartsdriver.com. Um, so I would encourage you to just have a little explore because there's, there's masses of information on that. Um, so moving on to today. Um, as I said, if you could just keep muted um, and keep your videos off, then uh, it just avoids interruptions. And just to let you know that we are recording this webinar. So if anyone has any issues with that, if you could please let me know. Um, so today is about how has Brighton collected, used and made decisions about visitor data in 2020? And we are delighted to welcome Gavin Stewart, the Executive Director of Brighton & Hove Economic Partnership, and CEO of Brilliant Brighton, the city's business improvement district. Um, for nearly a decade, Gavin has been at the forefront of growing Brighton's experience and retail economy, and we are looking forward to uh, hearing from him. Gavin, over to you. Thank you very much, Brian Maya. Uh, no. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for inviting me along today. I'm going to um, be giving you all uh, a bit of. A bit of background really about what makes Brighton and Hove tick, if I can make my computer work some. Um, and really this this conversation that we're having this morning is a, a bit of background about the the different sectors in the city, how the city works, what what data we use to try to come to a, a group agreement really on, on what the city should be doing as we as we go forward. So we're going to do the whole strategy piece, but then I'm also going to talk about the, the city's business improvement district as well, because that's hopefully some bits and pieces that you will see actively happening on the street in Brighton and Hove just now. Now this is quite dense, this uh, chat this morning, there's quite a lot of data in there. Um, I will share the slides afterwards, so don't worry about maybe taking notes or whatever, but equ equally, uh, on some of the slides, there is quite a lot of information. I'm not going to just sit and read through all the slides, so don't panic when, when a slide comes on and there's just lots of words on that page. We will, they're there for, for reference for you afterwards, really, ultimately. So, looking at the Brighton and Hove economy, one of the, the most interesting things, I think, actually, about our economy is that the, the sector is heavily driven by the, the, the public sector. Now, after the, the financial crisis in 2008 and the, the subsequent uh, contraction within that sector, you'd be forgiven for believing that, the, that actually we, we don't have such a huge reliance on our public sector in the city, but, but all these years later, uh, it's still the largest employer uh, within Brighton and Hope. Now, the second one may be a surprise to you, banking, finance, and insurance. And I know this element of today is largely about the tourism sector, and we, we do talk about it in terms of it being one of the biggest sectors, but it's, it's, it's still not number one or number two in the financial sector is, 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 is large and surprisingly growing in the city as well. And we're going to go into that a little bit later on when we talk about the effect that COVID has had. So we'll come back to that. So the, the oh, third yeah, one, Gavin, sorry, it's fun. A slight bit of feedback with the microphone. I don't know if. Oh, really? From me? Oh, there we go. No, it seems to have stopped. So I think I think we're good. <laughs> okay. Flag that if it happens again. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. um, and, and then the third one, looking at uh, the tourism sector, which of course is big for the city, and we will get onto that in uh, in more detail later. But it's quite useful, I think, just to to have that basic background of what, what the main planks are within our city. But what is the economy? Well, it's, it's huge, actually. Brighton and Hove is the economic driver for the city region here. Um, 140,000 jobs and uh, representing one or two jobs in this thing called the city region. I don't know if you've come across this concept of the city region, but we're going to have a little chat about that. Also, one in 16 jobs in the coastal capital local enterprise partnership area as well. So what are these two places, the city region, because we can't just look at Brighton and Hove 
on its own, just sitting down here on the south coast. So looking at the map, don't worry too much about the words here, but looking at that map, the Greater Brighton City region, essentially what we've got here is uh, a, a grouping of authorities, local authorities, regional uh, government, to, to come together. So if you, if you think about it in terms of, uh, of the Greater Manchester area, for example, that has got an elected mayor. Of course, we don't have the elected mayor down here, but this is the same sort of element of a, a bunch of, 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 of authorities coming together to support one another in terms of their strategic uh, aims and direction for, for the future. So that's the city Brighton, city Brighton city region area. And then we can move on to the coastal capital area. So you can see from that little map there, the coastal capital area is essentially a bit bigger, goes a lot further over to the to the west than the, the, the Great Brighton area does. But this is the, the body really that, that uh, siphons off money from central government down down into the region. So uh, they are, you, you probably have come across them actually during COVID, um, certainly during COVID in terms of trying to apply for funding and grants for business support over this time, but also they have significantly um, uh, invested in our local area as well. So again, coast capital are essentially that, that main drawdown of money to, to the city. So we've got this, um, uh, some facts, some, some interesting little bits of background data really, again, just to, to paint the scene for you in terms of how the city works and how the city runs. So there's a really strong growth within the city, 2,700 more businesses you can see there um, open, opening up over the last decade really. And the, this is a high growth area. And what's interesting, we'll go on to this again a bit later on, is that even with the, with the spectre of COVID um, uh, hanging over us, there has still been a strong entrepreneurial spirit in the city. And we'll see some stats about that later on. Um, again, you can see the enterprising economy there. And the ICT and digital sector too, um, rapidly growing within the city as well. Um, Part-time employment is an interesting one. People generally, have this uh, reference to when they talk about people come to Brighton, but Brighton and Hove is where 30 year olds come to retire is, is the <laughs> common adage. And it's, it's, it's borne out in the stats as well. People tend to have a high number, there are a high number of uh, part-time and non-permanent jobs down here, maybe some to do with the nicer lifestyle that we have. Also very open to international migrants and, uh, and very strong for exports as well. And we'll have a little look at some stats and some data about that later on, but this is a really interesting uh, side of uh, activity for us here in the city. Commercial to residential permitted developments as well. You'll have, well, certainly as we progress through COVID and, and whatever Brexit has to throw at us come January, we may well see these stats increasing as well. But there, we have seen a number of commercial premises being turned over to um, property development, which is obviously very much needed in the city in terms of homes. Most vast broadband, so it's a good place for you to come and set up your business and particularly work from home as well. Now. And a very strong um, civil society as well. So, uh, very, um, very active communities really in the city working with us. So, here we've got some stats really on whether or not we are a qualified city and what, what types of um, individuals and students we, we have. Um, MBQ level four and above, if you're not aware, is degree level and above. And you can see here that the, um, uh, sorry, skip there, that 50.6% of our residents have got MBQ four or above. So we are significantly, significantly higher educated city, if you like, than the southeast and the rest of the country as well. A lot of students, 7,000 students here annually, and that's, uh, sorry, graduate, and 35,000 overall. But there is this skills gap, and this is something that we have struggled with for many, many years. And if you've been anywhere even vaguely close to the, to the economic backbone of the city, you'll, you'll know that we have this problem where all of those wonderful 7,000 graduates, quite a lot of them do want to stay in the city, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, when they do stay, there simply aren't the entry level jobs for them in Brighton and Hove. So you will end up with an awful lot of people who are working as baristas or working in retail and therefore they're squashing out those entry-level jobs that potentially other people 
can come into the school leavers, for example, can, can, uh, can, can go into. So there's a real problem there in just in that disparity. Those graduate retention rates are interesting to look at, actually. So again, one of the, the things that we talk about are how often people, all these students are just staying in the city and no one's ever leaving. And this is one of our big problems. It's one of the, one of the myths that we have, really. But um, in Brighton, just over 20% the um, students retain themselves, if that's even <laughs> what you can say in Brighton. 80% um, you can see in London. We're, here's the, the, the um, graph, I don't know if you can see that very well on your screens, but we're quite low down there on that list, number 24. You'd be quite surprised to see that cities above us are places like Dundee, Norwich, Ipswich, Hull. I mean, I, I can say this because I was born in Dundee, so I'm not being particularly rude to my, <laughs> my, home, my home city or my own brethren, but you know, but if you compare Dundee to Brighton, there's not a huge amount of similarity there. With them. But then you see below us are places like Oxford and Cambridge, and largely that's down to um, just the, the sheer price of, of accommodation in the city. So if you're if you're a graduate, maybe you can afford to stay in places like Sunderland, Dundee, and Leicester, but you certainly can't really unless you you, you bag some really top job in the city. Um, you, know, you won't be able to, to live here. And the same goes for Oxford and Cambridge as well. Skills wise, there's a lot of good news in the city actually in terms of uh, how our young people are getting on at school. Uh, those needs, those not in education, employment or training have reduced by 2% annually since 2013. So we've seen that downward curve there. And actually there's some really fantastic stats here in terms of uh, uh, how our schools have been judged uh, by, by Ofsted. So we've got 100% um, of our secondary schools judged as good in the city, which is quite staggering, really. And it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful stat to be able to report. But again, even with all this really positive information around our schooling system, employers in the business sector are still reporting these gaps around soft skills, and work readiness. And people just being able to do the really simple things of just being able to turn up to work looking smart, looking clean with them, with, um, with, uh, with an eagerness to, to work quite simply. So there's, there's some issues there around that as well. So let's look at this now. Are we a connected city? Well, you know, we've seen certainly during COVID that things changed quite significantly. We're now back up to something like 30% of the pre-COVID levels. 100% pre-COVID levels, commuting-wise, um, just under 30,000 commuters coming into the city on a daily basis and 34,000 going out on a daily basis. And when you match that up with the, the footfall of people at the train station as well, you can see in this little list here from London, Victoria, down, where the one station outside London, really, um, that, that meets that, that top five on the list there, there is a significant number of people trying to get in and leave the city at any given time, particularly during the, the rush hour time. So you can understand why, why we get a bit log jammed at those specific times in the day as well. Is it a good place to live and work? Well, as I was saying before, and I'm sure everybody on the call here is more than aware that um, it's nigh on impossible to get yourself on the housing ladder if you're not already on it. 13.3 times the average salary there to get the, the average house price in the city. Looking at office stock, actually, again, we really struggle here in the city. 2% of the total available stock is A grade in Brighton and Hove. So actually, if you are uh, a young company, you're wanting some really top level offices, you're going to be quite hard pushed to find them in the city. But this is the issue that we have here because actually people, when we talk about inward investment, people want to invest in Brighton Hope, they don't necessarily at the moment want to invest in that wider city region that we spoke about earlier. So these are some challenges that we've got facing us just now. Are we a well-paid city? Well, this frankly is quite a depressing slide for everybody. The, the median salary is 31,700 odd pounds. That's not so bad if you're male. 34,000 is your average salary. If you're female, unfortunately, you're, the average salary drops down to 29,400. So that gender pay gap is still very much alive and well, unfortunately, in Brighton and Hove, and is something which uh, employers uh, across the board need to address. Ultimately, looking at where we sit 
we're a bit below the southeast median we're a bit above the uk median so you know we're, we're, it, it's not a, a sorry tale in terms of the, the whole country but it, 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 it's quite clear that things need to be done about that as we progress forward so who's not working well is this the, the 30 somethings that need to retire in brighton i don't know but we are above the national average in terms of ONS claimant count. Um, really, we can, we can discuss this until the cows come home. We can have a bit of a chat about this later on. <laughs> Why do people think that that is the case in the city? Is it a lifestyle choice? Is it not? I don't know. It's probably worth a bit of chat from us later on. <laughs> a working city, economic active people, 169,000, 162,000 employment. These are just interesting little stats I think I've just thrown in here just to give you a bit of a feel for it all really again um 79.1 percent we're a bit below the um the southeast average but we're bang on with the UK average there as well so people are working it's not as if we're, we're all sitting around on the beach just having our sandwiches or whatever Gavin yeah. just to just to jump in on that actually um yeah. Darren was asking why is that why do you think there's such a huge gender pay gap in such a progressive city uh -huh. Well, um, and this is it, and I think we could talk about this, as I say, for, for some time. Um, your guess really is as good as mine. The, when I talk to businesses, it's not something, because I've, I've given this presentation, this talk certainly to a whole different range of different organisations, and I've so your rooms full of people and we've got to that slide on the on the gender pay gap and there's been audible gasps in the audience of people just being kind of outraged really about it but then when we talk to those businesses that are in the room everybody's absolutely on the same page everyone thinks that yes we should be we should be 100 percent of this absolute level with pay mm. um looking at our um the, the industries that work in the city were a relatively low value in the uh, industry economy, if you like. So there, there aren't that many jobs in Brighton and Hove that have um, high value added, i.e. High, high pay levels. So that your creative digital sector jobs, your financial sector jobs, some of them will have the higher value pay, so £40,000 and above, for example. But a lot of them will be very low level pay. So a lot of them are going to be um, jobs that are in uh, uh hospitality leisure um uh, retail and so on and so forth mm. now, it's going to be a massive generalization when i say this so you know, don't don't hang me up for it but uh, quite a lot of those jobs um are quite often taken by um women particularly in the hospitality sector as well um so th that could be one of the reasons why there is that that gap just in terms of the Oh, 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 that male female split but equally at the same time there's a whole bunch of other theories why it could be the case as well so it's um mm. you know, it's endlessly it's, debatable i'm sure yeah exactly yeah um, so moving on to the the population of the city but you'll if you've lived here for any length of time you will have noticed that it has grown <laughs> and uh, continues to grow but it doesn't actually grow quite as much as we think it, it does, if that makes any sense at all. So in the southeast, we're actually below the southeast average. So, you know, walking around the city, when I talk to businesses, quite a lot of people are saying, well, everybody comes to Brighton, that's where they all come from. They don't want to be in London, they all come to Brighton, and that's, that's where they're all going. But actually, in terms of the southeast, they're not all coming to Brighton. They're, they're spreading themselves around a bit more elsewhere in the city, but then and elsewhere in the, in the region. But looking at the UK increase, you can see that, yes, people are funneling in this direction rather than funneling elsewhere as well. So that trajectory looks like it is going to continue. Mm. So we'll go to the strategy side of it all now. Now that we've got all that, all these little numbers looking about in the back of our head, how do we solve this problem like right and what how do we use all that data to to make some sense really? So well there's a, there's a few things and there's quite a lot of strategies flying around and lots of it's a paper here, the city plan part two. I don't know if that's something which has um, come across anyone's desk who's on the call at the moment. And it's actually been consulted by the local authority just now uh, until the end of October. So you can have your say on this as well. So it's worth logging onto the council's website um, consult consultation portal and having a look at that. But ultimately, this city plan part two is really, it really looks at the development sites in Brighton Hall and where, where we can develop, where we can build housing, schools uh art spaces uh, transport links you name it it's all in there so it is worth having a little look at, uh, at uh, how that is going to potentially pan out as we go forward it also sets out where we're going to be able to build all our homes that we need 
in terms of the next, uh, well, by 2030, starting there's another 13,200 homes. Uh, the planners reckon we need in the city uh, just, just to stay level, not to actually grow at all. Um, and again, going back to this earlier bit of conversation we had about the Greater Brighton Economic Board, as I say, Brighton doesn't sit on its own in isolation. We have to work with our local neighbours. Well, I say have to, that, doesn't, that sounds like it's a, <laughs> under duress. <laughs> These, our local neighbours all want to work with each other. So you can see the list of uh, different areas there that are, are made up the Greater Brighton Economic Board. And that looks at how we can spread some of that 7.1 billion headline uh, economic output that Brighton and Hove has across that wider city region. So what we want to be able to do is see some of that sprinkle within in Horsham, in Worthing, in Ader, in Lewis, for example. And also the, the issues around Gatwick as well. I mean, Gatwick really was the economic powerhouse in the north of the region, in the north of the region, if you put it that way. But now that um, COVID has hit and uh, there are significant issues really with the aviation sector now going forwards and masses of job losses within that area, uh, we're going to have to work a lot harder to see how we can really find those jobs and those uh, those careers now for, for everyone, but we have to work together as a region to do that. This little bit down here, the International Department for International Trade. Um, again, one of our aspirations, I, I suppose, is about inward investment, and that's foreign direct investment in the city. So I'll just give you a little aside here. We, uh, a few years ago, of course, probably about 2015, 14, 15, I think, we we worked with the Department of International Trade the, the, the back then, before they came to call the Department of International Trade and uh, just waved a little bit of a flag for people to invest in Brighton. So essentially what the, what the DIT do is they advertise the, the country abroad. So they'll go to Hamburg, to New York, to wherever, and they'll say, Britain's a great place for you to invest in. And then there'll be a bunch of cities, towns, areas in the country that are already created some pretty good uh, propositions they're called for why people should want to come and invest in the local local area and in Brighton we haven't really done that very well at all so back in 2015 we created some pretty basic I'll be honest with you two sides of A4 this is why it's great to come to Brighton come on guys and wave the flag around and that delivered over the course of that 2015 sorry I'm last year so a year later brought in 64, 65 million pounds of additional investment into Brighton Hope. Now, largely that was uh, around the creative digital sector. It was uh, individuals from largely Europe, mainland, and the USA coming to the UK and setting up their, their relatively small digital organizations. But you can see the added value of, of, of that sector already just from those numbers alone. So, from, from this data, from this kind of experiment, if you like, We've now progressed quite significantly with that Greater Brighton Economic Board to deliver an inward investment desk within the region as well. Because if this is what we can do without really trying too hard in Brighton and Hove, hopefully we can replicate that across the rest of the rest of the region. And we'll get onto that a little bit as well in, in detail later on. It's always nice to compare oneself with everybody else. It's a you know, <laughs> thing that we do being British. Um, and just here's a if I can direct you to the, the Centre for Cities Outlook report from 2020, it's a, a really interesting little read just in terms of how we rank uh, with the rest of the UK. You can see we're the second highest in the UK for startups, so again, really entrepreneurial city here. We're ranked third in the UK for business stock, which actually stands uh, a, a kind of a, as an opposite to what we reckon here locally. So. Um, I do worry about what the rest of the country's business stock looks like uh, if we're only third and, and Brighton's is even safer it's in. Um, eighth in the UK for residents with high level qualifications. So we've got the talent and we've got the skills here for really high level organisations to come and land in Brighton and Hove. Ranked four in the UK for housing affordability. That's not a good place to be ranked for housing affordability, unfortunately. Um, we're, we're just a very expensive place to live. But, but we are. Uh, and third in the UK for our lowest energy emissions. Yeah. So it's an interesting little bag of, of, uh, of stats there. So for all of you who are really interested in having a look at just that strategic landscape and wanting to 
of things that are going to make you not the be fall off to sleep too quickly, but um, uh, there's a little list of the stats, so, so the plans that we currently have live in the city at the moment. Uh, and, and they're all, they're all worth the look. And what we're talking about here today are a few of the, the linear threads that have been drawn from all those strategies into this conversation just now. Um, yeah, so our economic strategy and inward investment strategy. So this really is looking at once we boil down all these numbers and once we actually start to get an idea of what it is that we want the city to be looking like in the future, one of the one of the main things that came out from all of our consultations that we did with businesses, from all this data that came in, was this word disruptive. And I know it's been overused, and I know it's probably a bit lame as well, but it's something that Brighton Hove happens to do really well. And when we first um, showed this strategy in its draft form to a number of different uh, uh, partners, one of the people were quite upset by the word disruptive. They kind of felt that. They didn't want people to be coming to Brighton and being disruptive. They didn't want us to be advertising the place somewhere where actually you, you could come and come and do all this crazy stuff. But the, the fact of the matter is that Brighton, by virtue of its, its DNA, is a disruptive place. People want to come here and they want to try out new things. So it's an actual linear thread here again for the for the strategy and for the vision of the city going forward that we are open to collaborative and informative ways of working. We want that disruptive nature. Disruption doesn't necessarily mean people come down here and throwing off their fireworks in the middle of the street. It's, it's actively coming down here and looking for new and exciting ways that they can work together. So, oh yes, I was going to stop here before I wanted this. Right, so it's probably worth us having a bit of uh, an open chat here for a few minutes. From what I've been saying, thus far, there have been 10 defining challenges that we reckon have, uh, can be distilled out of that whole conversation, that wider conversation about the, the, um, uh, the, the stats within the city. And I'd be interested to hear from people on the call what your thoughts are for the challenges in the city. And then we can kind of go through what came from, from the strategy, if that's okay, if we want to open up for a bit of a chat. Yeah, so if you want to type your questions or your state or, or your statements, or if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to just um, chip in. <laughs> it always takes a minute, people typing. Or <laughs> Are people typing because I can't see from my... Uh, it doesn't actually let you know. I'll, I'll kick off with one. I mean, presumably, um, you, you touched on it earlier in terms of um, commuting, but presumably transport has to be has to be in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a couple of comments coming in. So um, Donna is saying huge number of creative freelancers, which are very precarious, especially now. Yeah, absolutely, Donna. Yeah. Yeah, so that must be. And uh, Lauren saying uh, employment feels like the next biggest challenge from an individual level. Yeah, yeah. Shall I, shall I crack through these then? Do, do um, your big reveal. Do big reveal, yeah. Um, and cost of, cost of housing, cost of living, um, Sarah's saying. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Number one. And this isn't actually in any order, so so it's, uh, this is just how they how they've come out. This isn't like the, the, this isn't the most important thing being number one here, but the economic identity of the city. So what we need to do is create a very clear image, not just for inward investment from foreign direct investment, but for people within the UK to come and invest in the city as well. We haven't got a clear central place for people to be able to do that from. Mm. Productivity in the city is comparatively low, and um, but again. The, the structure of our economy that I was talking about earlier in terms of that, that retail, leisure, hospitality sector being um, a bit of a blanket across the, the economy. That's one of the one of the issues. And again, this issue of the 30 somethings coming to retire and rising hope is productivity is it's largely quite low. Supply of jobs is difficult. So that I can remember one of the um, somebody had mentioned that idea about employment, and certainly that is a huge issue for us going forwards. Um, Certainly the number of jobs is a problem, but also the quality of the jobs. And again, this reflects back on the, the, the pay gap for, for one, but us being able to have 
a decent level of decent jobs in the city so that graduates can actively get them in the city as well and they don't have to commute out of Brighton and Hove to go and, and find work. Commercial space for businesses to grow as well has been a huge problem ever since I've been involved really within this, this world. Um, and again, this, um, this jobs skills gap. So we've got a very high number of graduates and university uh, individuals within the city, but actually there's an awful lot of people within the city who, who aren't that educated as well, haven't reached that level four that the, the university educated people have got. So again, there's that, there's that skills gap there. Um, community inclusion. So we've got a couple of areas within the city that are of, uh, of there are significant issues, I suppose, really, within with, in terms of with people being able to access jobs and skills and uh, and, and and all sorts of uh, uh, life. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's gone down. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's a, there, there are certainly issues within the city for inclusion. Um, Housing supply, somebody mentioned that, and absolutely, and that really is not sustainable and that needs to be dealt with. Transport was mentioned as well, um, certainly transport across the city, east and west. So that's that slide that I, I showed earlier, I don't know if anybody picked up, but the in, in terms of North Street in the city centre, 4,000 buses go up and down that street every day. And, and I know that um, the bus company are trying really hard to find more sustainable um, and green energy sources for for the buses, but still 4,000 buses on a relatively enclosed space every single day is not good for anybody as well. So there's that double double edge there, um, and that deep leads us on to the to the climate challenge issues within the city. We've actually got very high levels of um, I suppose the simplest way to say it, bad air in the city, uh, and, and we need to be dealing with that as well. And we need to be able to respond to change quickly to one of the one of the issues is that there, Brighton's a wonderful place in terms of people wanting to to do stuff and crack on with things but at the same time there's still quite a lot of silos still quite a lot of different people working in different areas and not working quite in partnership with each other as one would hope so so those are the things that kind of come through uh, certainly from that first uh, tranche of um, can we just Pause yeah. there. Can we do, do just want to yeah. go back? I just wonder if anyone yeah. has any um, specific comments on any of those. Uh, Don has also mentioned a couple of other areas that aren't specifically mentioned, but um, the, the state of the city generally, heritage, rundown, etc. Yeah. Um, but also um, mental health challenges higher yeah. here than yeah. average, yeah. Um, and 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 I suppose highlighted even more so. Yeah. Now for, across nationally as well as within Brighton. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, well, both those points are are, are really key as well. The the, the set, well, the state of the city one, we'll come on to a little bit with with the conversation around Britain, Brighton and what our aspirations are for the city mm -hmm. centre certainly, um, and the mental health one as well has been a, a clear message. I think would be best way to say it from our conversations with um, different sectors within the city around the COVID challenges and. Pre-COVID, uh, it was something which was rising up the national consciousness, and people would be much more aware of mental health challenges uh, for individuals, and, and making sure that there was support there for them during this whole COVID um, experience that we've all gone through. One of the top things that businesses are saying is that they they, they understand now even more the need to to be looking after their their staff and their teams as well. So it's something which is starting to bubble up and become much more of an issue, I think, in the city. As well. Shall I move on? Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we've got then taking all of that stuff and looking at what we can do to try to make the city a better place. We've got four kind of headings, really, I suppose, that we are focused on. I should say that this, the economic strategy that we write, we we write in partnership with the local authority. So we, as the economic partnership, are a group of well, it's always in flux, but there's 50 odd uh, representatives around that table, chief exec CEOs of the, the larger, more strategic organizations in the city. From across the board, so not one sector is, is overrepresented against another. 
and they they come together to write this economic economic strategy in partnership with the local authority. So hopefully, in theory, there's there's business buy-in there behind this as well. It's not a council say document that's going to sit on the shelf. So you can see here again. We're not going to talk through all these, but so there's aspirations here to be a, a, a growing city, looking at innovation, looking at working with our universities, um, looking at uh, housing and. Uh, enterprise zones and so on. EV charging is an interesting one here. Um, the local authority has already started embedding electric charging throughout the city. So there, there can be that shift, a modal shift to, to new types of transport. Looking at open cities, so really being here for business investment and looking to support the visitor retail and culture offer within the city. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well with the economic, with the uh, business improvement district chat in, in a moment. This key action here is this new trade and invest team for Greater Brighton, um, and again, that's really talking about what that what that proposition looks like in terms of if you're a foreign business and you wanted to invest in the city, how do we really sell the city going forwards? A talented city. So again, we need to increase the productivity within our workforce here in Brighton. But not just in the city, so it's around the, the regional skills agenda. So we want to make sure that everybody across that whole wider region has got access, the same level of access to, to be able to learn new skills to, to upskill. Because there's, there's this feeling now that people have, well, I say feeling now, it's been for quite some time now, that there's no longer a job for life, certainly even back in the early 90s, the idea of a, no, a job for the rest of your life, the same job for the rest of your life was a bit of a, an alien idea. But understanding now that actually we need to be much more engaged with retraining individuals all the way through their lives even up into to later stages in 40s 50s and so on and then equi equ equ equitability is that even the word i don't know if it is but um, <laughs> being fair across the city equitable i suppose really with everything not just our economic success but also our social inclusion as well it's, it's all very good and well to have this as I say, 7.1 billion pound economy in the city, but it's only supporting one section of our society and not absolutely everybody uh, within the city, then there's a real problem there as well. So there, there, there needs to be a real focus on that element of inclusion too. So now just to talk a little bit about the inward investment strategy, again, going back to that little segue I had earlier on, this is where there's the potential for some really significant and uh, uh, good investments come into Brighton Hope. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk you through all this slide here, but looking at the propositions, it's all just about these four headings. These propositions are promotion, how we, how we coordinate and how we care for those businesses once they come into the city. And that proposition really, it's not just about you know, what the business space looks like and whether or not we've got broadband. It's stuff like, what are, what, what are our schools like? Is there enough childcare? What's our sport? And provision like in the city? What's our arts and creative provision like in the city? If you come to live in Brighton Hope, are you just going to be stuck to your uh, to, to working in your office or are you going to be able to go out at the weekends or during the week and go and be able to see some arts theatre, etc.? I mean, notwithstanding the issues that COVID have presented and the and the severe issues that the arts sector has faced and is facing in terms of uh, bums on seats, the the, the the aspiration, certainly pre-COVID, and hopefully we will get through this, is for the city to have a that wide range of offer for everybody. So that proposition is a is a much much broader thing than just that one slim economic um, pr pr proposal, really. So again, we're looking at this wider city region as well. That's ultimately trying to get people to understand that in, in, in investing in Brighton might actually mean investing in Hayward's Heath. It might actually mean investing in, uh, in in Worthing, because people investing in those places, there, there will be the economic benefit that will float out to that wider area as well. Now, exports is a really interesting one. Now, this graph is a complete sorry, mind blower. But if I can draw your attention over to the far right hand side here, where it says London, and if you move to the uh, to the left, you can see Edinburgh, and then the next name that comes up is Brighton and Hove. Essentially, what this graph is telling you is that Brighton and Hove is only third behind London and Edinburgh in terms of exports. 
uh, in terms of per, per, like a service or, sorry per job. So that's people sitting on computers largely um, offering up their services uh, across the, the world. And it's really interesting to see all these places that come behind us here. But there's a there's a real opportunity for the city in terms of being somewhere again entrepreneurial where exports and services can be really supported going forwards too. And that again that sits within that 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 proposition for the inward investment as a it's, it's a good place for people to come and do that kind of interesting stats here. Okay, so the sector feedback during COVID again, I'd be quite interested to hear what people around the room uh, how how they fared actually during this. One of the one of the roles of the economic partnership has been during the pandemic to try to find out from different sectors what and how they are feeling, how they're coping. And we've been asking three questions largely. One, what do you need from your local authorities to support you and sustain you? Two, what do you need from local government? And three, is there anything that you can provide to support your local community more? And I've got some bits of chat, that I, bits of information that I can tell you from the conversations that we've already had with different representatives from, from some of these sectors. But it would be really interesting to just to hear very quickly around the room how, how people have been uh, bearing. Yeah, again, does anyone, if you'd like to unmute and just mention, it's, it's, it's probably easier if you um, speak rather than type. <laughs> uh, we, we haven't got a sense of which sectors um, everyone's from. So if you wanted to say which sector you're from, um, did anyone want to chip in? <clears throat> Lauren, hi. Hi. Um, so I work at Fabrica Gallery in the centre of town. So we are a site specific um, art gallery where people, artists come and create installations, but we also do a lot of community work. Um, but all of that has stopped across the whole of this year, and we're looking at making no profit across this whole financial year and um, we rely quite a lot on private hire and to sustain us financially um, so looking at um, funding as an alternative really is our only option at the moment so I guess having access to funding that's maybe not just art, arts council um, would probably be a good um, option for us um, especially in terms of local government um, and just being kind of uh, put put in the spotlight for those kind of things. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I work in the non-profit sector, so we we generate our income through events, and obviously we can't put on any events. So um, we have been fortunate to get some funding, but it's it generally funding is extremely competitive anyway. But it's just been ramped up. And if you are a small voluntary led organisation, we, we don't have the infrastructure or the uh, resources that maybe larger organisations have. So you get these pots of funding that are available. There's a mad gold rush dash to it. Yeah. But you, you have to have the people and the experience to be able to write these bids to get in there first. So I think potentially um, additional support for smaller grassroots projects um, would be incredibly helpful because it time and time again we get so close uh, and then we miss out because you know everybody else is trying to well we're trying to do our day jobs and look after our families and then yeah. fit in our projects after yeah. our service leaders need us more than ever at this time of crisis so it's a bit of a chicken and egg yeah 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 um, Sarah, I think you had a comment. Uh, yeah, um, Rosie and I both work for Brighton Fringe. Um, you can imagine what this year has been like, but we are managing a small festival at the moment. It's something like 8% of what May was supposed to look like, um, and we've pivoted, so we've got digital events happening as well. Um, I really liked Dan's suggestion um, of more support for smaller organisations in terms of... Um, help just to get funding bids out. I mean, we're lucky that I have a member of staff and that's their job, but I'm aware that it's not fair for everyone across the city. Um, but really our main thing is a need for more coherent marketing of 
including us of what's what's going on in the city because everything is not shut down we've got 70 events happening this month um so that would be really useful if there was a channel for that um mm. that's me thank you and donna hi yeah gosh i'm adding to the same theme actually um because i think there is something around um you know i think what's been really demonstrated particularly recently with the whole um you know venues going red for live events and for live music and you know um brighton does events like extraordinarily well you know it's the real thing that gives us an edge you know i work all over the country and i can i, I can really tell you that the that the type of festivals and events that we have are are the, some of the best in the uk they're, they're really like just very much part of brighton's history and identity and i would really like to see the authorities come together and put a bit of not support as in fun just funding but really sort of be a bit ambitious about leading the way in facilitating events to happen you know because it's not just about giving money it's about you know um actually the events industry is incredibly entrepreneurial and and, and a lot of those creative freelancers that i was talking about so it's not about relying on public funding but it is about having you know an authority that works hand in hand with the sector to try and um support it you know um to to, to do what it does best and, and and i'd really like to see to see that sort of ambition and that bravery you can see a lot of local authorities being really fearful of events um, and it would be great if Brighton was the first to sort of step forward and say we know that these guys know what they're doing we believe in them and we're going to support it to, to, to happen in the same way and it's brilliant that the fringe is happening and uh, you know how lucky were we in summer to have Brighton Open Air Theatre, the Warren and Shakespeare in the Park happening three different theatre events extraordinary mm. something to be really proud of I think. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah really good stuff there thank you everyone. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I'm just think, thinking about that actually. We will, I, I will come on to to the funding or, or potential funding opportunities for the arts actually uh, when I talk about the business improvement district. So we'll hold that thought uh, for now. We are still continuing to talk to different or different sectors in the city. I think it's fair to say. So understandably, retail, leisure, work kind of real near the top of the list at the start of the COVID crisis. So there's a lot of conversations there really about people understanding just how to navigate themselves through furlough, etc. As we're coming out of things now, we met with representatives from the financial services sector. And one of the one of the most interesting things I think that came out of those conversations was, well my, my feeling certainly prior to having those chats was that if there's going to be a massive contraction with the financial services sector in central London, the city of London. We're bound to feel it here down on the coast, and there's a significant number of people who work within that sector in the city as well. But actually, what those businesses are saying is that yes, there will be a, a contraction in London, but what they're looking to do is uh, invest within their regional economies as well. So largely, actually, there may well be some good news there around, around finance. Creative digital, again, their their issues are around the skills gap and needing to be able to upskill people. They're very much aware that there's an awful lot of people potentially in the leisure sector and culture and heritage sectors who are going to be struggling to find work at the moment. But what they are saying is that they reckon that they're in a good position to be able to employ some of those individuals and train them up as well. Um, certainly there's been a move to well, as you may know that we're a 5G test bed in the city here and uh, we're one of the only, well, the only 5G test bed that businesses can actually test themselves on um, uh, if you want to be able to do that. And the creative digital sector has certainly started to, to move in the direction of being able to, for example, um, stream live arts events and so on and so forth uh, throughout the COVID pandemic. So there, there may be opportunities there as well. Um, hospitality is going to be one of the major issues within the city going forwards. Um, depending on what happens over the next few months in terms of lockdowns, uh, that that sector, as the culture sector, I'm afraid to say, is probably the, the most fragile, the, the two most fragile sectors really within the city at the moment. So, yeah, uh, you know, the points that you're making about ensuring that there's funding available for for those is is, is, is very clear. 
Um, I'm going to move on now to the business improvement district because where we've been talking about that kind of wider strategic view, the business improvement district are brilliant, right? And as you can see here from our logo, is is very much about that focused projects on the ground in the city centre. So if you don't know what a, what a business improvement district is, uh, yeah, it's uh, an organisation that's brought together, well, it brings together a bunch of businesses to, and they, they, they put some money in the pot, so they pay a percentage of their rate of RUs, they put the money into a pot, and that then, then pays for a bunch of projects that they think are going to improve their trading environment. But it's not all uh, kind of harsh bottom line business focus. They're, they're, there is that kind of wider sense of community cohesion within there as well and so they are there is a feel that they're investing their money in that in that, in that city center for everybody that works lives and visits the, the city so here's some just some information background about what we've been through in terms of ballot because essentially we we pull together a bunch of businesses and then we have to go write a business plan and we take that to ballot with them and then they vote whether or not they want to move forwards and pay this additional investment and over the last five years, we've just had shy of £2 million worth of extra cash to invest in Brighton City Centre. That's funded by a 1.25% levy on top of their business rates. Um, so, yes, and there are 517 businesses in the city. So it's probably worth saying here now that your, your bigger players, your Marks and Spencers, your Primarks, your people on Western Road probably put in you know, 10 to 15, sometimes higher than that, £1,000 worth of investment a year, whereas a smaller investor, someone on the north side of the lanes is probably putting in a, a two, three, four hundred pounds worth a year as well. So the, the larger businesses are, are, are largely bankrolling the smaller ones. We have four main projects. So we dress the city in the summer months, so that's panning baskets, bunting, uh, so on to try to make the place look attractive. We have a security element as well. So our city centre ambassadors, and then we also have our Christmas lights uh, that we have throughout the city centre as well. And that's just a picture of the Christmas lights that switch on. Then we also promote our businesses on to our brilliant Brighton web portals, Twitter, and so on and so forth. Um, the what we found really is that the the business community within the city centre, the ones that are actually paying for it, are are, are largely supportive of it. And when we go to talk to people without outside the city centre, who are not paying for it. They're largely not supportive of it. It's quite it's quite interesting to see that the people that pay for pay for the benefits um, are are much much more in favour. But just talking about the pay paying for the benefits is, might be of interest to to people. The Christmas lights is the reason reason the bid the bid exists. The business improvement districts exists. Back in 2006, before the bid appeared, Brighton won, I think, a national competition on Radio One for having the worst Christmas lights in the country. So the businesses felt like they had to move to put their hands in their own pockets for that. Annually, we spent around about £100,000 decorating Western Road, North Street, um, the lanes in the North Lane with, uh, with Christmas lights. Uh, and we do have an, an annual event that we, that we run with local partners and we get a bit of sponsorship for that as well. Um, and it's something which you know, largely, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite hard to quantify the benefit of Christmas lights. Does that bring loads of new businesses to businesses? Hard to say. Um, is it a worthwhile investment to spend £100,000 over the course of six weeks? Well, I'm sure people sitting around the room could find an awful lot of other things to spend £100,000 for on the, on the course of six weeks. But um, again, it'd be interesting to hear what, uh, particularly people from the arts, creative sector, uh, thoughts they have about that, but we will go on, I'll get onto that in a moment, hold that, hold that thought there. Dressing the city, this is our smallest budget, £30,000 a year, but we do bring in a, quite a, a good bit of, um, of sponsorship from that as well, because we do have banners on Western Road and North Street, so we, we, people can sponsor us and have their logo and their name bang through the city centre for you know, May, June, July, August, September, so not an insignificant amount of time. Uh, to have your logo up there in the streets and then we can also engage with local schools and so on and so forth. So that's a really, a really positive cheery project that we run. Our city centre ambassadors, they are the most expensive. We've got four people um, who patrol the city centre but they're there to support the businesses but they're there to support the members of the public as well. So we, we have, it's, it's a, a twofold role that they, they have. Yes, they will chase down the shoplifters so they've, they've responded or, or rather they've return something like £50,000 worth of stolen goods back to largely independent businesses in the lanes and the north lanes over the last year. But they'll also 
work with the with Sussex Police in terms of uh, evidence gathering as well. But then on their, their softer side, they're there to support members of the public as well. So you can see from this photograph that they're there helping some students on a, on a, on a little quest there. But also if you if you find yourself lost, you don't know the way to the station, the beach or what have you, you can stop and ask the ambassadors and then they can be there just in that ambassadorial role as well. And then we promote ourselves, or rather we promote this, what's going on in the city centre, within the city centre businesses, out to uh, the wider communities too. So we're there to, if you're, if you've got a new offer, or a new product in store, or you've got a new thing in your menu, or you, you've got an event that's happening that you want people to know about, we can be there to, to support those businesses as well. So we're constantly out there having that conversation. And that's really what that's about, it's about creating that conversation with the local local community and then what we try to do is add uh, some significant benefits to our businesses because they're putting money into the pot to pay for uh, these these projects that essentially benefit everybody who comes into the town center so we try to reduce costs particularly for our membership so i will negotiate a whole bunch of different things cheaper advertising with organizations um, cheaper rates for people to get involved and ultimately what that boils down to is that they can um, they can say, say say for example if you're a small business in the north line and you're paying what 350 quid a year for the benefits of the bid we can put a, a shopping basket of products in place so that actually they save at least 350 pounds over the course of the year as well so actually that investment becomes cost neutral to them in the first place um, data collection, again, no, we're, we're probably one of the only organisations that's out there doing vacancy rate surveys and city centre health checks as well. Um, just probably worth noting here that in terms of vacancy rates, the, the bid area is 7.62% vacant, the wider city is 9.18% vacant, and the national average is somewhere between 10 or 13 rules kind of fluctuates around. So we're still below the national average. Um, that's not to say that we haven't seen those vacancies increasing. Within the bid area from pre-COVID till now, that's increased by about 1%. And the wider city centre um, area, that's increased by about 2.5% since pre-COVID. But at the same time, of quite a lot of those businesses that have gone um, vacant, there has also been a, a, a quite a large number of new businesses that have already come into their places as well. So we're hoping that that entrepreneurial spirit continues and helps us weather this storm. Um, sure. So now we're reaching the end. Now you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> That's a precious lead. The future. What does the future look like for Blue Brighton? So that two, just shy of two million pounds there that I was talking about, um, is. Well, that, that investment will come to an end in June next year. So we are bound by a piece of government legislation within Brilliant Brighton that we've got to go back out to our businesses after a year, after five years rather, sorry, and ask them, hey, do you want to vote in favour of this again? And if you do, what sort of projects do you want to see happening here? So we're currently just now in a process of consultation with our membership and we're seeking to see if we can increase the bid area, not just by the footprint but also by the types of sectors that are represented within the bid as well now there's a there's a, a, a prize if you like on on offer for that if we do manage to increase the area just slightly and increase it by the sectors it means that we can potentially look at an income with, that is double what we've got just now so just shy of four million pounds a year and within that, we're asking businesses to say what sort of projects you they would like to see. Now I'm aware, looking at my own screen, because I can't even see this, but this area here, you see the number one on the, on the picture. Mm -hmm. There's a list of tick, tick boxes that we're asking people to, to have their say on what they want to see happening. And that stuff again, it's stuff like what we've been delivering already, it's Christmas lights and decorating the cities and so on. But there's also something in there about the arts and there's something in there about events and we're asking businesses whether or not they want to be uh, a funding body for uh, for, the, for, for, for creative industries ultimately within the city centre. Now really this is about attracting more people to the city and making giving people a new experience every time they come to the city but there's an opportunity here within the bid for us to be an organisation that somewhere between 50,000 maybe 100,000 pounds a year we don't know yet because we don't know what feedback we've had from the businesses is but we could have not an insignificant amount of money that could be 
there for us to create maybe a handful of events throughout the year or or whatever um, and and work in partnership with local organizations to be able to do you know, trails art installations street theater whatever um, it's up for grabs at the moment really but we're looking to to try to kind of reimagine what that city center experience feels like for people you know so yes you're going to come to brighton for the day but you're going to get a slightly different experience every time you come to brighton than you would have if you go on every time to Worthing or every time to A1 Station or what have you. So there's an opportunity there for us to potentially look at things like creative art, also to look at things like uh, the premium of the city. I think somebody somebody had mentioned just the, the general state of the city in terms of street cleansing and, and graffiti and so on and so forth. Now, the local authority simply doesn't have the money to be able to, to do the level of cleansing that we all want to see in the city centre that we as a bit could potentially have somebody hired to give a, a, a jet wash of the streets at least once a week for for like you know, city center areas and when you go up to victoria for example and you get off the train at seven o'clock in the morning you see somebody with a, a hose and they're, they're hosing down the streets that's probably being paid for by their business improvement district so it's something that we want to see if we can emulate that in brighton as well so we could welcome a lot more appealing for people uh, and just to make that whole Brighton visitor experience a whole lot more enjoyable for people as well. Um, I think that is me. I've come to the end there. Yeah. So uh, happy to answer questions or just have a bit of a chat about everything we've been saying. Just on that end note, um, uh, did did anyone have any further comments just on the back of um, of, of what you were saying before in terms of um, supporting that bid and and putting your thoughts forward? Please, please do unmute yourselves and, and hi, Lauren. Hello, I just wondered, I, I think that sounds really exciting and really um, promising, especially um, what you just said there about the uh, creative sector. Um, but I just wondered uh, whether there was going to be priority given to like local and independent businesses as part of that, because especially given, as I'm thinking of the example of Victoria and the new kind of development that's right there. And it, you know, it's something like that would feel probably quite jarring and frightened and that people would probably not enjoy the introduction or something like that. So I wonder if that was part of your strategy. So yeah, I'm not, so I'm not talking about um, development construction. I'm talking okay. about I'm talking about actual stuff on the streets to make the streets better in place. So my 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 uh, example of Victoria is simply just about people being out there hosing down the streets. It's not actually about the the huge, I mean, I don't even recognize Victoria now when I go there. It's really different. <laughs> it's really different. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, no, that, that's not our, our aim isn't to kind of reimagine what the city centre looks like in terms of its, its kind of wider structural physical space. It's about actually just making what we've currently got as attractive uh, and, and as appealing as possible. Because at the end of the day, people come here for the independent sector, and I mean that ac across the board in terms of arts, creative, retail, what have you. People come here for that one-off experience, really. And that's something that we certainly want to be able to to, uh, to help them to grow within the city centre. Thank you. Uh, did anyone else have any questions or comments about that or, or more broadly as well? Um, thank you, Gavin. That was a lot of information to... Uh, to digest <laughs> um, but it's fascinating I think uh, I mean certainly I, I'm in Hove so I'm just on the edge but um, the, the, the numbers the volume and the value of the numbers around what you're saying is is sort of fascinating as somebody who lives and, and works here and has children at school here and um, it's the sort of information that you don't it doesn't it doesn't pass your your door every day so it's really interesting to get a bit more of an insight into that so thank you um so i yeah just wondered if anyone else had any other questions i'll just check the chat um and donna is saying the same fascinating presentation and such a helpful snapshot snapshot of the city um actually dan had a question um more broadly he was saying with with the ongoing messaging for us to continue working from home oh dan you 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 chip in you're on mute that might help, might it? <laughs> um, with the ongoing messaging of for everybody to work from home, now we've had this this period. I, many people I know are never going to go back to commuting. 
they simply don't need to. Their employers have changed the way that they do. Obviously, that's a huge effect on all of the, you know, the local coffee shop and the sandwich bars and stuff like that. This is going to continue. Is there light at the end of the tunnel or how can we reinvigorate? Um, you know, I can imagine going into the, the city at the weekends and stuff like that. But if I don't have to go in nine to five anymore, yeah. that's going to have a huge impact on all of that local economy. So yeah. how is yeah. that going to be worked? Yeah, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think we can underestimate what impact that's going to have on the local economy. I think that's absolutely spot on. One of the one of the bits of feedback that we're hearing from, I'm going to call just very broadly the office sector, um, has been that there is still a need for people to, to see each other. So although there won't be that expectation to maybe be in nine to five, five days a week, there will still be a, not necessarily an expectation, but a need, but a, just a human need for people to be able to come into the office maybe one or two days a week or one or two mornings a week to come and have those, those team meetings, those brainstorming sessions, those water cooler moments where you get to talk about Game of Thrones or whatever, you know, but it's a, a, a just simple human nature. And what, what we've been hearing, certainly from some of the larger employers, so people like Amex, people like Legal in general, are that they are going to be looking to change the way that their office actually works. So rather than having a whole load of just desks and everybody coming in and doing their office thing, actually changing it up quite significantly to, to make their office environment feel a lot more like like a platform line, for example, or a, a, you know, somewhere where so there's, there's equitable equ equitable share, share of uh, break up space to office space so that people can actually come in for the morning and just have that social interaction with their, with their workforce. Now, whether or not that comes to be is, is another thing and whether or not that is going to be enough to be able to sustain the, as you say, the coffee shops and the restaurants and so on and so forth, that remains to be seen as well. One of the things about Brighton that we've got over other places is our tourist um, numbers, and something that I didn't actually bring up in the in the conversation there. But we've got, well, pre-COVID, <laughs> eleven point five million visitors come to Brighton every year. Now, when I talk to other, certainly other business improvement districts around the country, and I I, I say a number. Of that magnitude to them, I mean, literally, jaws hit the floor. They would put their right arms to be able to have that number of people coming to the, to their city. Now, I'm not saying that all those people come and they spend lots of money. They don't. Nine and a half million of them are day trippers. They probably spend five or ten or if that, they'll come back kind of lager from the store, go and drink on the beach, and get back on the train again. So, what we want to be able to do is encourage more um, short-term stay uh, visits. But when you look at the the trajectory for potential staycations in the city and look at um actually there's a there's a point over august when you know we, we were hearing very positive things actually from from hospitality and and from from retail um certainly the, the help out to eat out to help out uh, program was, was very supportive there so if we can maintain that tourist that tourism function in the city and we can maintain you know, keeping the place attractive, making sure there's enough toilets for people, making sure there's not enough reason for people to want to come here again and again and again. Hopefully we can see some way out of that. So it's, we're not completely relying on the office sector, that's what I'm trying to say. But at the same time, the office sector is going through a major state of flux at the moment as well. But we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, and I think office sector in itself is it, there's a sort of reimagining really of how that how that looks and how spaces that may may um, may not have traditionally thought of of inviting people in for those types of meetings might start to use yeah. their spaces in different ways. Not 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 quite so functionally as a co-working space per se, but um, more like a sort of community place to gather. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I think it's um, the need for for being with people and and. I was going to say touch, but that sounds odd in a in a business context. Yeah. But yeah. For, for interactions, I think yeah. is um, is yeah. going to be huge. Yeah, um, yeah. There's an, there's another question that's come from um, Lewis Jackson. What sort of opportunities would Brighton and Hove buses have working with the bid to support businesses? I work closely with the Manor Royal Bid, supporting businesses with their travel needs. For example, free travel planning sessions, workplace travel schemes, loyalty schemes. Uh, could I kindly ask for an email address as well, he said. 
Yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, um, the good news is that one of your um, team already worked very closely with us. So um, Patrick from your team is one of our directors on our board of management. So we, we have got quite a good relationship with Brighton Hall Buses, but by all means, it would be really great to talk about what other direct opportunities that we could uh, have that you can you can bring to the to, to our membership. I mean, we are in constant um, uh, contact with, with the members, so we would be brilliant to be able to pass on more information that's coming from your direction. So yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to share our contact details. That sort of raises the question, um, Lewis, saying he works closely with Manor Royal Bid. Do do bids interact? I suppose is that is that a yeah, we do. I mean, Manor Royal bid is slightly different to, to Brighton mm. City Centre bid because it's an industrial estate bid. Yeah. Um, but we, the Brighton bid's been going since 2006. The, the, the legislation for bids only came in in 2004. So we weren't quite at the back door, but we were pretty close to it. Mm. And as a result of that, and because we've been going for quite a few years now, we will be approached by other bids certainly along the coastal strip for advice and support where they have to get up and running and you know, what sort of problems have you encountered and what sort of things can we mm. be doing better to, not, i'm not suggesting for a second that we are the paragon of best practice tonight but, but at the same time we've been doing it for so long that we experience helps we, yeah. we really have now to be able to uh, encourage people to not make those mistakes as well so we, so we do certainly talk to our local neighbors but also we sit on a panel of what they're called big city bids um, I think we're probably the smallest of the big city bids because it's Manchester and Leeds and you know, proper big cities, not, not a Brighton big city size or, or, no, or places. But we do share just uh, uh, our common experience and, and, and best practice when it, when it helps as well. So we are in contact. There's probably something like 320 business improvement districts across the UK at the moment. Um, mm. Every major town or city has got one. It's the sustainable method really for town and city centre management really now. Great. So, um, anybody else have any questions? Thank you, said Lewis. <laughs> um, if anyone else has any questions and just wants to unmute or um, wave their hand. No, I think that's everybody. Um, so, I just, um, shall I just share my screen? Do you want to come off your screen? Or are you, if, are you stopped? Yeah, okay. you stopped. Um, I'll just go back in. Oops. <laughs> um, so that's that um, brings us to the end of a very interesting talk. I think we can tell from the comments there and um, and people's queries that um, it's just, as I said, a really useful insight into the city. So thank you very much, Gavin, for your time. And I'm sure, um, as you mentioned, if anyone has any specific questions, he'd be happy to um, answer them um, directly via email. Um, that brings us to the end of today's talk. The next talk um, in the series is tomorrow, and we will be talking about citywide safety through crowdsourced data. Um, this will be... Um, uh, a presentation given by the Chief Exec of SAFE in the City, uh, Gillian Kowalchuk, who um, created um, and has launched this uh, app to support um, women in particular who are um, in navigating the streets of London and how to keep them safe by sharing routes that have been sourced from, um, from the population of the city. Um, so that will be another fascinating talk, so do join us if you can. Uh, this is, these are just some other events that are coming up more broadly. Uh, please do go to driverartsdriver.com to take a look um, and uh, ensure that you've registered to hear about more events and opportunities that are coming up through the programme. Uh, so thank you very much to everybody. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and just say thanks very much. And we look forward to seeing you. Every, everybody's sharing comments, um, Gavin. So thanks for your time. And look forward to um, seeing how the, the the conversations go around the bid. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, good yeah. luck. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.